Hello and welcome to the exciting mini lesson on inventions and their importance in American society. As you can see by the cover of this book right here, The 100 Greatest Invention of All Times, a lot of people have put thought into what are the most important inventions and how did they change society. We're going to focus on the what are the most important inventions and how they change society in class itself. And by your learning about these inventions prior to class, we can spend more time on actually debating which of them are the most important. And we're not looking at the 100 greatest inventions of all time. We're looking more specifically at influential inventions from 1850 to 1915, because that's the time period we're talking about. We're not going back to look at da Vinci. We're not looking ahead at Steve Jobs. We're looking at 1850 to 1915. As we're going through this, your job is to keep score by putting some notes as necessary about the inventions. You don't have to do it for each one. You should just do the ones that you don't know, or if you find something interesting that comes up. And where better to start than in the early 1850s and the passenger elevator break? Looks exciting. The man, Elisha Otis, or Elisha Otis, is not the actual inventor of the elevator. In fact, people up to 50 years before had invented something called the ascending room, which would ascend and go up. The only problem is it didn't have an automatic break, so it could come down quite fast. And as you could imagine, the people were not so happy to go on that elevator. And it isn't until the elevator, passenger elevator break is made in 1852 that it becomes a lot safer. So still not 100% safe. In fact, each elevator had to have an operator to be on that elevator and stop it at the particular floors and also in case of emergency. Today we don't need those things because elevators are a lot safer and that started in 1852 with the passenger elevator break. Why it's important? Well, can you have skyscrapers without it? Can you go to the top of a tall building without running out of oxygen? Probably not. This allowed skyscrapers to develop in the late 1800s and is a huge reason why uh, ind industry also flourished. Our next invention is the Bessemer converter. Looking straight at it, look at it for a moment. What does it look like to you? Wait for it wait for it. Think Star Wars. Think a character. R2-D2? That's what it works like for me, except the Bessemer converter is actually a lot bigger. Let's take a look at a real Bessemer converter. So this is a picture of a real Bessemer converter, uh, certainly bigger than R2-D2 and bigger than all of these people right here. A huge, huge invention machine uh, that changes industry, steel industry in particular, forever. And essentially the way that a Bessemer converter worked, or still works today, is that iron, which is found in a natural form in many places in the United States, is fed into R2D, I mean the Bessemer converter, where it is injected with air and lit on fire. Please don't try this at home, by the way, because it would need to be about 5,000 degrees. But iron itself is impure, uh, brittle, rust, all sorts of problems with it. But steel, on the other hand, is not. But steel is very expensive to make and had been being made by hand for years. Now there's a new way to do it. You would put this in, you would light it on fire, and then out from the top opening would come more or less pure steel. Do a little bit more in class on that, but as you can imagine, much like the elevator break, this helps cities to grow, helps the country to grow, build railroads, then ship things on railroads. Next invention is the compression ice machine. Look how exciting that is. If you've ever been to 7-Eleven, and yes, I know you've been in there, or into Safeway, or anywhere where there is a refrigerated room where they keep the drinks, and you reach your hand in there and magically come out with a Dr. Pepper or other fine beverage, you've used the compression ice, mach ice machine before. When it was invented, it was first used on ships, and somebody had the bright idea that if you make a huge refrigerated room, you could move fruits from the Caribbean up to the Northeast and sell bananas that could still be fresh so that Yannick could enjoy one. Um, you could also move meats from New York, say, to South America. And this was started to be used in the 1850s and 1860s, and the problem was that the inventor uh, was not, uh, Thaddeus Lowe was not very good businessman. And so other people started to steal his ideas and use them on other things like the railroad, which we'll hear about with Gustava Swift. But the compression ice machine basically allows a huge cooled room. Not a small refrigerator or mini refrig, but a huge one. 
So it's good for businesses, but not really so good for the home itself because you can't put one of these in your home. Next up are two inventions that are very similar except the ways in which they are operated. First is the cable streetcar. The cable streetcar is famous in a couple of places, most specifically where? What? Louder? Huh? Can't you? Oh, good. San Francisco. The cable streetcar and the electric streetcar are very similar. Electric streetcar used first used in places like Richmond in the 1870s. The difference is how they are pushed and pulled along the track. You can see here with the cable streetcar that there is something underneath it pulling it, whereas the electric streetcar is getting its energy from above. They're both following tracks. They don't just randomly move through their way through the cities. But when you look at these inventions um, and you think about how they are moved from one place to another, you can think about amusement parks. What amusement park ride pulls its ride with a cable and then releases you at the top and you go plummeting down and start to do loop-de-loops. That's correct. That's correct. The answer is a carousel, at least a bizarre one. The electric streetcar uses the method of electricity from above and sometimes sends sparks below. What amusement park ride can you think of that uses that system? I'll let you think about it. That's correct. It is the frog hopper, I think. Whatever. Okay. Those two inventions are obviously similar. They came out around the same time period. It's just a matter of uh, the method in which they are moved. Moving on to the telephone and Alexander Graham Bell. We're going to watch a very short video in class on Wednesday that shows this race to get a patent approved for parts of the telephone. Um, and it's between Alexander Graham Bell and some guy you've never heard of. The reason why you've never heard of him is because Alexander Graham Bell gets the patent in first and gets credit for the telephone for that period and forevermore. And this is what the first telephone would look like. The year is 1876, and it's the 100th anniversary of America, the um, centennial. And at the centennial, there's an interesting quote below here. My word, it works, it talks, exclaimed Emperor Dom Pedro of Brazil on June 25th, 1876, when he listened to the receiver of this early telephone at the Philadelphia Centennial Exposition. One of the judges, Sir William Thompson, later Lord Kelvin, called Bell's invention the most wonderful thing in America. At the same time that this was being unveiled, the Battle of the Little Bighorn was happening in Montana, and that news would spread by telegraph and by letter because the phones could only reach across the room at this point. While we're focusing on inventions of the time period uh, from Alexander Graham Bell, now we're going to be moving over to Thomas Edison and some inventions that he made, at least two of them in a row. The first is the phonograph. This is also known as a wax cylinder, also known as a record player. The record player later becomes the CD or compact disc, which of course later becomes the MP3 player. So certainly there's been progress since this old thing was wheeled out by, uh, um, by Edison. He considered it his most important invention, and we'll be listening to something from that in class on Wednesday. Thomas Edison most famously credited with inventing the first practical light bulb. Much like a lot of things that Edison put out there, he was not the only one to think of this. He wasn't the first person to be like, oh, that would be great if there was light and it was not the sun. There were other people who thought of that. Um, they just couldn't make it, uh, find a way for it to work. What Edison was able to do was find a filament or burning object inside the light bulb that could last more than a few seconds. I mean, you could make a bulb like this and, and light a piece of paper on fire. Don't try this at home. And it would last like three seconds. Well, you wouldn't want to have to change that every three seconds. So his light bulb, he experimented with a number of different filaments, trying to find something that would burn longer, and finally came up with, um, with a filament, carbonized filament, that lasted longer to make it a practical light bulb as opposed to impractical. He was not the only person to come up with this idea. He just was lucky in finding the right thing, although it did involve a lot of hard work where he tested out over a thousand different products to find one that would work. And once he found one that would work, he um, got the patent for it. And often it's all about patents, as you're going to see in class on Wednesday. Certainly that changes our world in many different ways. Okay, cash register, kind of random, throw it in there. The cash register certainly improves businesses, uh, business transactions because it's the first kind of calculator type thing. Of course, you had abacuses before. 
But now with the calculator, you could certainly, uh, or with the cash register, it would help businesses run quicker, more efficiently. Back to Edison for a moment and the electric power plant. Everything that we're running today at home and in school runs off of a power grid or power plant. And that's why when the hurricanes came through and they knock over some of these wires that connect you to the power plant, you lose electricity. Usually the power generator itself is working. It's a matter of getting the electricity from this to your house. Not so easy. Thomas Edison was the first to get this going in New York City. Uh, they powered an entire city block with this type of object. And now, of course, we have grids that go all across the country, and sometimes when there's a problem in one place, it affects problems in other places, or creates problems in other places. Moving back to refri factory refrigeration, and Gustava Swift, who was supposedly the, enter, or the inventor of the refrigerated train car, which you see here. Really, he was even smarter. What he did was he paid somebody else to invent it. And they kind of stole ideas from the other guy who had come up with uh, inventing or refrigerated boat. So it wasn't that it was new, it was just that he applied it to something new, much like Ford would do later. And here's a look inside of the refrigerated train car and what you can see are the meats that have been slaughtered in Chicago or elsewhere and they're now being moved by train. What allows them to be moved by train is cooled air which is circulated from these ice tanks up above into this area and keeps the meat as fresh as possible. The, his competitors did not like Swift at all because it allowed him to sell meats much cheaper and they started a smear or ugly campaign against him by saying that his meats didn't taste fresh. They said that his meats didn't taste fresh, that it was um, unhealthy, why would you want to eat something that was slaughtered a week ago? But of course it proved to be very, very sanitary in the long run. Next up, the fountain pen. Just because it's cool. And if you think about it, for hundreds of years, people had been writing by using the old quill pen of Thomas Jefferson days, where you would have to keep dipping and dipping and dipping into the ink before you could write, and this was a very long process. The fountain pen tries something magical, which puts the ink in the pen. Yet it took hundreds of years to figure out how to do that and how to distribute it, and each time you press down on the pen, more ink would come out, and you could do these fancy designs. The coolest thing about it was this bizarre creature came with each and every pen for free. Automatic air brake, I'm going to discuss a little bit more in class because I need to do a demonstration on that, so I'm going to leave that for now, but it changed transportation forever. The zipper, 1890s. Well, think about how many things have zippers, and they are all made possible by this invention. Um, it's something that has changed fashion, but also changed things for a practical purpose. Next up, the gasoline-powered car. As I pointed out, it was not invented by Ford. Some people say that it was Carl Benz in Germany. Others say that two Frenchmen came up with it. So much of invention is a race to see who gets it, uh, the patent for it first and who can prove it to others who came up with the invention. It's not like people just automatically, these random people said, oh, let's have this horseless carriage that makes it work. It was a combination of effects that made it work. The typewriter is invented, and you talked about quill pens before. This certainly change, changes everything, and it is also very expensive. Only the rich could afford the typewriter, much like only the rich could afford the telephone at first. You have the first motion pictures, thanks to Edison. We're going to see some of these in class, and we'll talk about those later. Then you have radio transmission, and radio transmission is rather interesting, because once again it comes down to who gets a patent in first. The man pictured is Guglielmo Elmo Marconi, and the reason why I have him is because his name is the coolest ever in history. Not only do you get to use the word googly, then you follow it up with Elmo, and then you throw Marconi at the end, that's an award-winning name. And he is an award-winning inventor, because he gets credit, perhaps wrongly so, for inventing wireless transmission, a.k.a. the radio. The real credit should probably go to this guy, Nikola Tesla. But his patents didn't hold up in court until they did, then it's kind of confusing, so we'll save that for later. And also because we're running out of time, and you know most of these things already, this is the time period when Powered Flight, 1903, comes out with the Wright Brothers, and where the assembly lines are now adding the conveyor belt and making cars much faster. 
last but not or second to last but not least are plastics which are invented in the 19 or in the early 1900s and home refrigerator gotta go now because this will only allow me to make a 15 minute video and i'm on 1459 up oh, done